Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Eborn, and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and participating in our webinar, uh, helping us to explore ways for children to learn and play from home. Today, our guest is Ravina Kingra, who is a school occupational therapist, and she will be helping us to explore different ways to encourage home learning with sensory and play activities. Before I turn the time over to Ravina, I would like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. Uh, first, we will not be taking audio questions, but you can submit your questions through the questions interface and go to webinar. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation. Ravina is planning to take around 40 to 45 minutes for her presentation, and after she finishes, we will start answering questions in the order in which they were received. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, and a link to the recording will be uh, posted on our schoolhealth.com website. Uh, we'll also be emailing uh, each and every one of you a link for future playback. And for everyone who attends today's live webinar, you'll be receiving a certificate of attendance uh, for joining us today, and you should expect to receive that this afternoon. Um, again, that certificate of attendance will come out this afternoon for all of those who are joining us live. And lastly, if you're having technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, uh, we would ask you to please call GoToWebinar directly at 855-352-9003. Again, that number for GoToWebinar is 855-352-9003. And now we'll turn the time over to Ravina. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ravina Kingra, and like he said, I'm a school occupational therapist. And we're going to be learning today ways to encourage home learning through sensory and play activities. And so the objectives for today are how to create a routine for your student or child, the at-home sensory strategies to promote learning, and at-home education or play strategies to promote learning from kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, so for those who really want to understand why routines are important, as an occupational therapist, we really want parents to understand that this is how you normalize the day for students. Um, uh, so as for the nonverbal and young children, you want to create a picture routine. And so if you're a parent listening in on this, you can ask your occupational therapist, speech therapist, or teacher, special ed teacher, to create this picture routine. It should try to emulate the, the day of your um, schedule. And if you talk with the parents to see what their schedules are like, this will create a really great customized schedule. And this is just an example of a daily routine supported by a busy toddler. It's very descriptive. And you can see that, especially for kids who are in preschool or kindergarten, you really only want to do probably 30 minutes to an hour of preschool learning. And this is an example of a written schedule that's more for Older kids, you can see that there is academic time and creative time and chore time, which we'll get into more later. I really like using timers for children who have autism or ADHD or who just don't really understand that this activity that may be preferred or not preferred is going to end. And so my favorite timer is the one, it's the third one from the top. I really like that for the younger kids because they are more interactive. They see that the green means that they still have time to play. And then once they have two minutes or one minute left over, it turns to yellow. And then once the time is up, it turns to red and it makes a noise. So then that makes it easier for them to transition. Timers are a really great transition tool. Uh, and there's a variety of type of timers that you can use depending on your student's or child's needs. Some may benefit from a more visual timer. Others could understand how uh, the timer works through an app. Um, so really, you can just see what works for your child or student and go from there. 
what I find is that for older kids, the first or second timer is really great because it gives them a visual picture of how uh, much less time they have when they're completing an activity. And for younger kids to use the colorful ones, the ones uh, that have more music to them and that really are more uh, audio and visual, audio and visually appealing. So now we're going to move on to sensory strategies. Um, there's three sensory systems that tend to overwhelm a child. And the first one is the importance of vestibular input. And vestibular input is the sensation of any change in position, direction, or movement of the head. And you usually want to work with your child or student two to three times per day in the morning, afternoon, and evening to help their arousal levels uh, in order for them to perform activities. But we understand that for parents right now in unprecedented times, it's very hard to try to do your work and get your kids to follow the routines that would usually happen in school. And so I recommend that at least do 15 minutes of vestibular, vestibular input for your child because it can last up to 12 hours. And you want to have the child participate in vestibular input before completing an activity that requires sitting down or focusing. But because the vestibular input strategies are very, it can be very uh, harmful for the kid if not done correctly, I highly suggest using an occupational therapist recommendation and to just make sure that your kid isn't showing signs of dizziness, getting red, um, sweating. There's a lot of signs that show that maybe there's just too much vestibular input. So please talk to your occupational therapist to ensure the safety when applying these strategies. So there's two different types of vestibular input that a child may need. If the child is showing tiredness or they're sluggish, they are gonna need an alerting type of vestibular input. And this uh, is looks at unexpected rapid movement, bumpy or jerky movement, changing direction, bouncing, or head inversion go, uh, going upside down. So some strategies are jumping on a trampoline, um, doing somersaults, and that should really make your child go from tired to more alert and awake and be able to participate in seated activities or academic activities. As for the calming qualities of vestibular input, if the child is crying or running or hitting or tantruming, they're gonna need more slow rhythmic movement um, a linear movement go, that is in one direction, slow movement provided by deep pressure and something that's predictable. So something like a rocking chair or if there's two people and they're able to swing the child in a blanket, that would hopefully calm them down and allow them to do seated work for academic activity. The other system is a proprioceptive system, and proprioception is basically your the ability for you to understand your body awareness. And for students seeking proprioceptive input, they tend to crash or they climb on things, they'll hold their pencil with deep pressure, they'll really seek deep pressure, and the behaviors will lessen and students will be able to engage in learning when given intensive input to their muscles and joints. So some examples of this would be weight-bearing activities like crawling or doing push-ups, push uh, resistant activities, which is pushing or pulling, heavy lifting, like carrying books or toys around, running or jumping, providing deep pressure, like tight hugs, a compression vest, a weighted backpack or a weighted lap pad, and uh, allowing there for to be oral input like chewies and chewing gum. Like the vestibular input, there's also two different types of proprioceptive behaviors. The most common one is on the right, the proprioceptive seeking behaviors. And those are kids that will run into objects, walls, or people. They use extreme force. They stomp or walk loudly. They have poor body awareness. They'll kick, bite, and hit. They'll have poor personal space. They'll prefer tight clothing, um, they'll chew their clothing, 
pencils and fingers. The other lesser known is proprioceptive avoiding behaviors. These children tend to appear lazy or lethargic. They'll avoid active activities. They can be a picky eater. They prefer to sit still. They avoid touch from others. They seem uncoordinated and they uh, look to do familiar activities and they have difficulty using stairs. And so this is more for the occupational therapist and the teachers to determine if their child or student is showing any of these vestibular proprioceptive behaviors. These are just things that they can do at home in order to accommodate that. And so if parents are looking at this and they think that this could help, I really suggest that you talk to your occupational therapist or teacher before uh, doing especially the vestibular input type of strategies. So these are just some examples like riding a bicycle or taking a walk that's really going to help with the proprioceptive input. Um, lying on the couch with the head down and looking at the ceiling, that's really going to help with vestibular. Swinging in a blanket is going to help with vestibular. Uh, pulling the child on a blanket, that's going to help with proprioceptive. Jumping on a trampoline, that could help with proprioceptive and vestibular. Uh, sit and spinning, sit and spin or spinning in an office chair, that's going to help with the vestibular input. Passing a ball overhead and through the legs, that's going to do vestibular and proprioceptive, especially if the ball is weighted. Um, sliding and climbing on playground activity, climbing on things, that's really going to help with proprioception. And then creating an obstacle course to crawl under, over, through chairs, that's going to help with vestibular and proprioceptive. So I encourage occupational therapists and teachers to look through these strategies to inform parents which ones are best for the specific student. And you're going to look at their age, their ability, their interests. And so that's going to be really important when creating at home sensory recommendations. And so this is just an example of a school sensory diet or sensory rec recommendation versus an at home sensory diet or second sensory recommendations. So for a lot of my students, they have sensory diets at their school. And so what I'm doing is I'm making a at-home one that correlates with the school one. So if one of my kids needs swinging in a linear movement for calming input, we have a swing in our school. But because most parents are not going to have swings in their school, I'm saying, well, have them rock in a rocking chair or swing in a blanket or hammock to get that similar input. If they were pushing a weighted cart in school, I think that helping with vacuuming, carrying a laundry basket, carrying a box of toys, that's gonna really be similar to pushing a weighted cart. Let's say they need movement breaks every time they sit down for 30 minutes and do a seated task. What we do in school is a movement break and what you could do at home would be a YouTube movement break or going for a walk or using Go Noodle. That's a really great tool online. Let's say the child needs to jump on a trampoline to let out all that energy. If you have a trampoline in your home, that would be useful, or they could jump on the bed if you if parents would allow that. And um, let's say they use a compression vest when they need to do a seated activity to provide that proprioceptive input. At home, we can also recommend a compression vest if parents are willing to purchase one, or they can use tight clothing, Under Armour, uh, different, or they can just squeeze the uh, joints and arms to get that same effect. And this is just an example of an at-home sensor strategy that I sent home to a parent. And so I explained that the student seeks pressure and proprioceptive input before completing a task, and he would benefit from the following recommendations that should com be completed for 15 minutes before sitting and attending to a task. And so uh, what I recommended was squeezes on shoulder and arm, which is considered joint compression, carrying a bin of toys from one room to another, completing a puzzle activity with the belly on the floor, which is considered prone, throwing or kicking a heavy ball, doing a wheelbarrow, and rolling a therapeutic ball on the back or bouncing on a therapeutic ball or completing an activity with stomach on the therapeutic ball. And usually I would provide visuals too of uh, what a wheelbarrow looks like, what completing a puzzle or activity with the belly looks like, and what uh, rolling on the therapeutic ball on the back looks like.
Um, and these are just items that if parents are like, hey, I really want some more sensory items to purchase for my kid, because even though right now they're uh, doing schoolwork at home, these are also really great purchases to make for when they go to school and they come back and they need to do homework or they're just really dysregulated at home and they need to do some of these things in order to then sit down for lunch or dinner. And so um, a weighted rubber texture ball, that's a really great purchase to make in order to uh, give that proprioceptive input. And you could do really fun things with it, like bowling. You could have set out pins and then have your kid um, take this weighted rubber ball and throw it. You can also play catch or have the child throw the weighted rubber ball in bins. There's just a bunch of different ways that this is really engaging for students and your children that would really benefit them for the proprioception. Another great purchase could be a compression or deep pressure vest because we use this a lot in the school, especially for them to sit down and do an activity. If the child is running around the house a lot, can't sit down for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, this is a really great purchase that can help um, correlate what's going on at school to the home. Another great investment could be a wobble chair. Uh, this wobble chair is really great for kids who seek a lot of movement. So for kids with autism or ADHD that can't seem to sit still, a wobble chair or a seat cushion or any type of accommodation that would allow the child to kind of move while they're sitting would be a great purchase. If your child or the student is putting a lot of things in their mouth, they're really biting up their clothing, oral motor chewies are really great purchases as well. Um, and the occupational therapist will be a really great resource for you to understand which purchase is beneficial for the student because I have some kids who are younger and they like the texture, so they might want the one, this red one over here. I have other students who are older in high school and who really would chew through this in three days, so they need a more uh, firm chewy, and so these ones are a really great purchase. And then there's some that like to bite their wrist, so sometimes you need something for your wrist so to prevent your child or student from biting their wrist. The third system is your tactile system. And the tactile system, there's two ways. One, your student or child could be defensive. And then the second system with tactile is that they can really uh, be over-responsive and want to touch everything. And so for those who want to touch everything, water beads is a really great investment because you could hide the alphabet in there and they could pick out the letters and try to match them on a placemat set aside. I find that my kids really enjoy water beads. They love the texture. It really calms them down. Um, it's just a really fun activity that also kind of has a lot of routine in it. And all they have to do is pick out a letter and put it, put it on the placemat. So that really doesn't ask a lot for the kid to do, and they're able to relax and do an academic activity. So I really like that for some of my students. Um, another great tactile activity is playing with sand, the kinetic sand. Um, and this, they can do a lot with it. They can imitate you. So if you want them to make a ball, they can make a ball. That's really great. A really great skill is imitation. If you want them to make letters with the sand, they can make letters with the sand. Um, and also, if they just need to squeeze something and you're teaching them how to do pre-writing strokes, that can also be really helpful for them to just keep busy while they're learning something else. If you don't have uh, the water beads or the sand and you don't feel like purchasing it, there's other tactile things that you can do with your child or student. So you could put rice and beans in a bin and you could, that would be similar to the water beads. You can hide the alphabet, you can hide puzzle pieces, and they can then try to find them and do the activity that's placed on beside the rice bin. 
you can also um, have your kids play with shaving cream. So a lot of the times we'll put shaving cream on a table and we'll try to have them first play with it and explore with it. And then we'll try to see if they can do letters or pre-writing strokes. Uh, and if they imitate that, that's great. If they're not, at least they're getting some tactile play with it. And then also a great activity is making slime or Play-Doh, especially for kids who put a lot of things in their mouth, making Play-Doh that maybe won't taste good, but is safe if they do ingest it. That's a really great way to be interactive with the student and kid and have a lot of uh, hand strengthening and motor planning and bilateral coordination. There's a lot of great things that happen when you have your child or student make slime or Play-Doh from an occupational therapist's perspective. And so now we're gonna be moving to the at-home learning experiences. So I broke this up into different grades. Um, and for the early childhood, kindergarten or first grade, these are just a list of activities that you could be doing with this um, age group. And so a lot of the times we'd be doing pre-writing strokes. So doing lines, vertical lines, horizontal lines, circles, curves, and that really will help the student to eventually uh, do write out letters. Coloring is a great activity that really helps with handwriting, pressure, um, making sure that they're coloring within the lines, understanding the direction, making sure that they're coloring the whole picture instead of just one area. Cutting with scissors is also very important, if, especially in early childhood and kindergarten. If you just let the child explore with scissors, so usually what we do is we'll have them explore with the scissors and cut Play-Doh, because that's a little bit more fun. And once they do that, we do some hand over hand and try to show them how to open and close, open and close. If they can use regular scissors, that's great. I always try to use regular scissors at first. And if I notice that they're understanding the movement, I'll start with snipping. If they don't really understand the open and close coordination, I will do a uh, scissor. I'll, I'll find scissors, adaptive scissors, that just have them squeeze because that's an easier motion than opening. And when they squeeze it, I'd be able to see, first I want them to snip, and then I want them to cut a paper in half with a straight line. Um, so depending on the student's cognitive and level and hand strength and all these other factors, the occupational therapist and teacher would really be able to see which type of scissors are beneficial for your student or child. Stringing beads is also a really great activity for fine motor and bilateral coordination. Learning the alphabet and sounds, you can do that through the YouTube video or just being interactive with the child. Dressing is also a really important um, activity to see if your child can zip or unzip and put on their jacket or take off their jacket. Toilet training is really important too, to continue working on with your child while they're at home. And also making a simple craft you can find on Pinterest. You can ask the OT or teacher what kind of simple craft your child can make following one to two step directions, writing or tracing the name, that's more important in kindergarten and first grade. So what I have some of my students do, especially if they aren't understanding how to write letters or their name, I take a highlighter and I write their name and then I see if they can write their name when with the highlight um, lettering. And I wanna make sure that they're doing the correct orientation, that they're not just tracing um, from bottom up or from right to left. And then I think it's also very important to encourage parents to do hand strengthening or core strengthening activities. And right now, because parents have to do it all, I think it's important to not overwhelm the parent and focus on one task a week. So as for core strengthening activities, this is really something that they could be doing every day or every other day. They, could incorporate play like relay races of different poses. They could do a bear walk, then a crab walk, then bouncing on a therapeutic ball. Twister is also a really great core strengthening activity and doing yoga. Um, hand strengthening activities are also really important. Right now we're seeing a decrease in hand strengthening with all children. 
um, because what's happening is they're not using their hands as much. They're on tablets or they're watching TV a lot more. So their grip isn't great, which means that doing dressing and handwriting and all these other types of activities is becoming more difficult for typically developing children and for children with disabilities. And so it's really important to encourage parents to naturally allow for hand strengthening activities to occur. And these are just some examples that I gave for at-home strategies, like playing with Play-Doh. And what I like to do is I put beads in and I have the kids pinch them out. I also think crumpling paper into a small ball and throwing it into a bin or making a fun activity out of it, that also helps with hand strengthening, especially for the younger kids. Squeezing sponges when taking a bath, water spray, using water spray bottles or a squirt gun, that could really help. Playing with Legos is great for the fine motor and the pinch. Stirring cookie or cake batter is really great for gripping and um, motor movement. Cutting with scissors and coloring pictures, those are great just activities that you can do naturally with a student or child and that'll the more they do that, the better their hand strengthening will be. Playing on a playground like climbing, that's really great for both core and hand strengthening. And then playing operation, playing some certain board games. If you really look into the board games and really think, okay, is my child doing things with their hands? That Those are really great games to purchase. And squeezing a blue bottle, like making crafts. If they have to use two hands, you can tell that maybe their grip isn't great and allow them to squeeze a glue bottle with two hands, but eventually you're gonna want the child to be able to squeeze a glue bottle with one hand. And that's how you can track progress as well. As for second, third, and fourth grade, that's when handwriting starts to become important um, and the child is starting to write words and sentences, also cutting complex shapes like a diamond or a flower, coloring complex pictures, that may allow for a little bit more um, motor planning and coordination. And once again, you still continue to do hand strengthening and core strengthening. You could have them categorize animals or foods. This is where uh, it's important for children to now start understanding their feelings and emotions. Completing a puzzle is always a great activity and always I'm always a big fan of doing crafts. And so to make handwriting fun for parents and for the children, I like to use different mediums like shaving cream or a chalkboard or a dry erase board. A lot of my students who have difficulty with pressure, a dry erase board is great for them to start writing their names or the alphabet. They really enjoy that it's easy to move. They love erasing it. They think it's magical. A chalkboard, they also love to use, um, and that's more for kids who apply a lot of pressure and so the chalk will allow them to use that pressure and um, not tear a paper or something like that. Um, and shaving cream is always just a fun medium because it's shaving cream and it's, it moves and it's very malleable. Also um, painting with q-tips that's really fun for children and you could do lettering or just a fun activity. For nonverbal kids or for kids who are going to show a lot of behaviors when they need to go from a preferred activity to a non-preferred activity, I really recommend first then boards and the teacher, the OT or the speech therapist can create a first then board that will really help the student to understand, okay, first we do um, handwriting and then you get an iPad or first you get the iPad and then you'll do handwriting. I tend to I tend to do the non-preferred activity first, so handwriting and then do a preferred activity like an iPad. I also think it's important for us to tell the parents that they should speak enthusiastically when the child has tried the activity, even if they didn't do the activity the way that parent wanted them to complete it or perfectly, it's really important that we still speak enthusiastically and tell the kid that, oh wow, like you tried to do a line even if it didn't turn out the way that it was supposed to turn out. And these are just examples of ways to make handwriting fun using a chalkboard. The slam board would be really great if they're using that at school and the parent is like, wow, they're just really not they don't really have a good coordination. 
with their wrist movement. And so if the child is using a slant board at school, the occupational therapist or teacher maybe should recommend for the parent to use a slant board at home. If they don't want to purchase a slant board, they can always make a homemade slant board. So this is just a binder that's turned inside out and then they taped paper clips and then you just put the paper underneath the paper clips and there you go, you get a homemade slant board. As for scissors, there's different types of scissors and you can ask your occupational therapist which scissors are suitable for you. Like I said, um, I try to use regular scissors or um, scissors that have this thing on it because that helps when you put this yellow thing up, that means that they can squeeze it. And once you put it down, that's when they can open and close it. So I really like these type of scissors to start off with. Um, and then these are great for kids that are just learning the movement of gripping. So especially for preschoolers. And this is great for children who are wheelchair bound or who um, need to use a switch to start cutting. So it's really great to talk with your occupational therapist to see which type of scissors are suitable for your child or student. As for fifth, sixth, and seventh and eighth grade, that's when I start really teaching them how to type. I really like typing.com. Um, it makes it fun and they do a really good job of breaking it into first doing the home row key and then building up from there. They also have really fun games on there. And I, as an occupational therapist, I can see their progress. They can do a uh, one minute test to see how fast they're doing it and how accurate they're doing it. I also like teaching emotion regulation skills because this is the time that their hormones are getting out of whack and they don't really understand how they're feeling. Um, this is also important to increase technology skills and increase their organizational skills for when they go to high school, following multi-step directions, hand strengthening and core strengthening are still great, and playing board games that match based on their cognition. And these are just examples of different techno assistive technology purchases you can make. Um, I really like this yellow keyboard. I use that a lot with my students who are in junior high, just because they are only allowed laptops. And so it's really hard for them to see the keyboard on a laptop and this makes it bright and they're able to connect it to the laptop and start typing. Um, this is, where is that? This one's a Bluetooth keyboard. These ones are very colorful and really make it easy for um, visually impaired children to use. And as for the mouse, this is a switch mouse. This is more for children who can move their uh, hand and just um, use, if they need to just use a ball, they can use the ball for uh, moving around the cursor. And once again, if, the, if there's a parent that's watching this, if you really feel that your child could benefit from an assistive tech type of uh, computer device, talk to your occupational therapist to see which would be best for your child. And as for high school, um, especially in this unprecedented time, I really want my children who have uh, autism and intellectual disability, I want them to focus more on becoming independent or participating in the household. So that includes cleaning, cooking, or doing laundry. You can help them to write a resume. You can see if they know how to use Google Maps. They can follow multi-step directions um, or follow a list. Playing board games still are a great way of incorporating cognition and uh, multi-step directions and playing sports. I think is a great way for high schoolers to still keep that core strength and hand strengthening. So um, if you want your child or if as a teacher or occupational therapist you want your students to become more independent in chores because chores if they become more independent or participate in chores this can be similar to then becoming prepared for vocational tasks and so um, there are easy tasks and then there are harder tasks for chores. 
So making the bed and folding and putting away clothes, wiping services or taking out the trash, those are easier tasks that a parent may not have to watch over, make sure that the child is being safe because these are already safe practices. Once you start getting into more difficult chores that require more uh, understanding of safety, like vacuuming, washing dishes, and doing laundry, that's important to then talk with your OT and speech therapist to determine if it's safe for your child to do more complex tasks without the OT supervision, because safety is our number one priority. So there are gonna be tasks that parents may think, oh, well, it's easy to vacuum floors. But if you have a child who has a cognitive impairment, they might not understand how to plug in a vacuum appropriately and safely. Um, and so I think it's important for parents to model the safety of these more difficult tasks and washing dishes. I think it's important to model to the child the steps to wash the dishes. An occupational therapist or speech therapist can also provide pictures and step-by-step -step actions that the child needs to do in order to perform it safely. And also uh, completing laundry, that's also important to model and practice safety with them by supervising. And so these are just questions that you can ask. And if you talk to your occupational therapist and you, you really want your child to do dishes, the occupational therapist can come up with different questions to make that they can ask the child to make sure that they understand what they need to do before they complete this task. And so these are just sample questions like, what should they do if a glass breaks while washing dishes? And let's say you want your child to make oatmeal. Well, you might think, oh, it's really easy to make oatmeal. You just put some water in the oatmeal in and then you put it in the microwave and you take it out. But a child who has cognitive impairment might not understand you have to wait um, after microwaving food. So it's really important to ask how long should you wait after microwaving food? And if they come up with a good answer, you know that it's safe for them to use the microwave. How to safely plug something in. Um, so make sure that they don't put their hands in the sockets, make sure that they hold the plug safely when putting it in. Also, if you want them to make a sandwich and cut the sandwich in half, how to safely cut a sandwich, that's important to know. Um, it's also important if the child can verbalize or understand the proper steps to complete the hard task. And then can they verbalize or understand how to practice this activity safely is the key. And um, these are the citations for the, uh, the busy toddler. That's an example of a routine. And these other ones are just uh, samples that I got for vestibular proprioceptive input, um, samples that they can do at home. And now we're open for questions. Great, thanks, Ravina. Thanks for all of that wonderful information. That was uh, was really quite a compelling presentation. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that we have received some questions that have come in during the presentation, and uh, you're welcome to send your questions in now if you haven't had a chance to ask one. Uh, we will get through as many of the questions as we can. Uh, we may not make it through all of them, but we'll try our, our very best. Uh, also, to let everybody know, we've got uh, Dr. Ray Hype on the line with us, and we also have Terry Griffin. Um, Ray and Terry are our uh, special education specialists at School Health, and they may be uh, chiming in and adding, you know, a comment here or there as Ravina ans uh, answers some questions for us. Um, just want to address a couple of questions that I have seen come in uh, over and over again. Um, probably the most asked questions. Uh, first of all, will you be receiving a certificate of attendance for the presentation today? Yes, you will. Uh, we will send that out to you by email uh, after the presentation is over. You don't need to email the request. Uh, we will just send that automatically. Uh, a number of people have also asked about uh, the slides and the recorded presentation, um, along with mentioning that a few people have had some audio difficulties uh, either visual or audio difficulties. Um, we will be sending out an email uh, once we are complete here that has a link to watch the recorded presentation. This will be hosted on our YouTube channel. Yes, you can share that with parents. Yes, you can share it with colleagues. 
Uh, Ravina has also generously given us permission to share her PowerPoint presentation. So we will uh, be sending that out as well. So to those who are asking um, about viewing this later, about sharing this later, or for those who have had uh, any technical difficulties, yes, we will be sending out the presentation uh, via email along with the PowerPoint, and uh, you can use that, you can share that, um, you can review it you know, later on down the road. Um, other questions that have come in about the products that Ravina has talked about, um, of course, we have all of the products available on schoolhealth.com. If you have uh, specific questions about a, a product you've seen, we can try to answer it during this time. Uh, you can also reach out to us at School Health, and we're happy to help you where we can. And let's jump into the questions now. Uh, we've got a question, Ravina, that came in. Um, let's see here. Question from Marlana, and she's asking if we have suggestions for children that are very disabled, uh, very physically disabled, I'm sorry, uh, or for children who may be in power wheelchairs. Um, yes, what type of strategies? Uh, she did not specify. Um, she okay. Said, any suggestions for children uh, who are physically disabled, uh, very physically disabled, or in power wheelchairs? Right, and so um, that's really where you want to um, encourage the parents. I, I don't know if they have it at home or if you've been using it at school um, to use switches, because if you can plug in a switch into a computer or a um, or a toy, that's really going to give a lot of cause and effect. And so, even with children who have very limited mobility. A switch will really help them to um, interact with what they're doing. Um, there's other things that you can do. Uh, let me think. Um, it kind of depends on their impairment as well. So if they're not really able to um, type, I think there's a, hold on, let me show you. I think uh, a good purchase could be um, a headset. I think, oh, it's not on here, but um, if, I think uh, School Health offers like a headset, correct? That they put oh. on their head and they can move around to interact with the computer as like a, as a keypad, mouse? Yes, yes, we do have those kinds of things available. Uh, I can let Ray or Terry uh, chime in on that. They've got a few, a, a bit more experience with the head mice uh, products. Yeah, if if you don't mind me chiming in right now, a couple of things about that. It really is dependent upon the individual, and that's why Ravina and I thank you so much for continually doing this. Talking to the OTs is of the utmost importance because the OTs have such a great understanding. There are going to be some individuals within either a power wheelchair or with uh, significant issues that they may not be able to use a switch right off the bat. So one of the activities that we can do at home right now in order to get some of that movement going around is actually by using a paper ball or paper wad as we used to call it you just crumble up a piece of paper and if they're in a power wheelchair basically what you're having them do is you're you're knocking the ball towards them and then having them knock the ball back or even trying to pick up the ball and just get that pincer movement going on and getting an idea of cause and effect but again a very simple cause and effect in that way Another thing you might wanna take a look at, again, I'm thinking at the home setting and just some things you can do right away. If you've got that individual in a power wheelchair and you're trying to do some strengthening exercises with, um, with the hands that they might be driving the power wheelchair, some of you may have dried beans at home in a bag that you're getting ready to make for a soup. Those are usually in one pound bags, and I love using those and recommending those as a couple of things. They can be a great lap pad, but they can also be something that you can set down on a wheelchair tray and try and have an individual grasp and pick up. One of the great things about those bags is that the beans will actually kind of move and contour 
towards the hand as it's coming in so you don't need a specialized grip so that's another thing you want to do then when we're talking about some of the other various types of head mice or even something like a, a glass house those are devices that will move towards once basic skills have been mastered. But thank you for pointing that out, Ravina. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you both Ray and Ravina for your thoughts there. Um, got another question here that has come in about guidelines around weighted vests. Um, when you're dealing with weighted vests, is there are there guidelines around the weight that you use and the time that you use it? Does it vary per child? Uh, Ravina, can you comment there? Yeah, um, so there's a lot of debate on weighted vests. The weighted vest is different than a compression vest. So a weighted vest, a lot of OTs are starting to not use weighted vests just because um, there's not a, as much research that shows that they're working. Um, but if, and if the OT decides, hey, this child benefits from a weighted vest, um, then usually it does you you do have to determine what weight is beneficial for the child so it's really dependent upon each child just talk with your occupational therapist if you feel that your child could benefit from a weighted vest um and you're not supposed to wear it for more than 30 minutes a compression vest is used more often now because there is no weight involved and you can wear it for a little bit of a longer period. And also, um, it gives the resemblance of a hug. It feels like a hug. So what they're seeing is that the compression vest is a, more beneficial for the proprioceptive input that the child may need. Um, and also, talk to the occupational therapist. If you're using it, you want to use it at home because there's guidelines towards that as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, switching gears a little bit to uh, oral stimulation, I'm seeing some questions about uh, chewy tubes that are coming in, oral chews, um, and in, essentially people are wondering, what are the strongest and safest oral motor tools that can be used um, if, if parents are in a situation where maybe they don't want to run out and purchase a chewy tube or something like that, are there things that are safe to use at home. Is that for me? Um, yeah, well, uh, would you guys be more able to speak to that? I would think that um, this one right here, this tube that's uh, thinner, we use this in, a, in our school and it's this is the most durable in our uh, experience. Okay. Um, Terry or Ray, do you have any thoughts on uh, items that may be used at home uh, for oral motor skills uh, for chews? You know, that's a that's a very good question. You've got to analyze what it is that the individual <clears throat> might have at home that they might be chewing on. Um, the difficulty comes into play that all too often we might just stick something in our mouths and there is a there is no transference between someone on the neurotypical side putting like a straw in their mouths that would actually be safe to say oh yeah just have them put a straw or something else that we'd normally see in their mouths because of the fact that the the chewing mechanism is a little bit different you tend to have your nars or you tend to have your grinders coming in and so a lot of times it's just safer to actually have something that you go up that has been specifically modified for an individual to be able to put into their mouths. Um, a a Rolla chew, R-O-L-L-A chew, actually for me has been one of the stronger things to have out there. Because my concern is always going to be, you don't want to have someone put something in their mouth so that they might bite through and then create a choking hazard. Yeah. Terry, any thoughts from you? I agree. There are a variety of, of chews. It can be fairly inexpensive, but they, they do come in different um, firmness, if you will, because you have, uh, 
as Ray mentioned, you have some kids that will just like to nibble in, in essence and some that are really chomping down. And so to avoid having anything bite through and, and cause a potential choking hazard, look for something that does mention that it has extra firmness to help avoid that. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Terry, Ray, and Ravina. Um, just a, a note to everybody in the audience, I'm seeing a number of people ask questions about specific products that maybe they saw on the slide um, or something that Ravina pointed out as she was going through her presentation. Um, for those that are asking specific questions about a certain product, we will do our best to reach out to you directly uh, with the link uh, to that product uh, so that you know which, you know which, which one we're referring to, how you might find it on the schoolhealth.com site. Um, for uh, for the group, for Ravina and then uh, Terry and Ray, if you have any thoughts, I'm seeing many questions come in uh, around items that uh, people are able to use at home, um, where you know they may be in a position because of um, uh, you know financial related uh, difficulties during everything that's going on right now using things that they already have at home and not having to go out and purchase things. And I know that, Ravina, you had a slide on this as we were going through the presentation, but can we spend just a, a, a bit more time on items that parents might be able to use at home without having to, uh, to purchase something additional? Um, yeah, so if it's in reference to sensory strategies, this slide is really great for um, showing all these things that you do at home without equipment um, in order to do proprioceptive and vestibular input. For tactile, um, really anything that your child, that you see your child um, is really interested in. Like I remember as a kid, I was really interested in magnets and that was my way of um, play, like of getting that like tactile, pulling apart magnets and, so if you just kind of look and see what your child's doing throughout the day and see what they really like touching and what they gravitate towards, you could probably incorporate that more before they do a seated activity. Excellent. Thank so, you. Any any thoughts from Terry or Ray here? Yeah, so I did. Go ahead, go Ray. Ahead. Sorry. No, Ray, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, some of the things uh, I am a big fan, as you heard of, of you know, using a, a bag of dried beans or even dried beans as Ravina described to do some things, or even a bag of rice. Um, again, using it for a variety of different things because a lot of us have those around. Sponges, sponges can also be something that can be used for multiple things. Um, first of all, sponges can be used in the tracing of letters. So going back to one of the techniques Ravina was talking about, you working on some of those fine motor skills, but how do we trace letters on a sponge, you ask? Well, very simply, you take the sponge, dampen it, and then what you do is you just take a little bit of dish detergent and basically outline the letter on the sponge. That individual then can actually trace that letter on the sponge, they're getting different types of feedback. They're feeling the smoothness of the dish detergent on the sponge, along with also feeling a little bit of the porousness of the sponge. And the great thing then, after you've done some letters and ideas, maybe creating some words even, then you work with those individuals right over a sink and show them how to use that sponge to clean dishes or something else where now you're taking an object, but making that object more applicable to life in general. So I love using sponges and, and dish detergent for a multitude of ways. And then the, the final thing that I love to recommend, and a lot of times we'll have it sitting in a pantry somewhere, is Jello. We can use Jello and literally just, you know, as the adult in the house cut out various letters or shapes and have the individual describe it and at the end of the session that we're using they have a little treat that they can actually chew on too as they go through so those would be some quick things around the house um mm -hmm. terry i'm sorry go ahead oh, i was thinking as far as um uh, tactile input and, and, and texture things like like velcro either side if you want something a little more prickly or softer, uh, duct tape has some texture to it. 
things like if you have a, a picture frame that maybe is kind of ornate that gives a different type of texture. So look for things like that that you might not normally think about for touch. Um, cotton balls, their softness. Um, just you kind of need to maybe use your imagination, but there are probably a lot of things around the house that you wouldn't necessarily think of for that, but can definitely be used that way. Great, thank you all, uh, great input. And I'm also seeing a, a comment that came in from Amy, who says that you can make braided cloth chew necklaces from material you have at home. So that's a great idea too. Yeah. All right. Do you have um, anything like uh, the wristbands that you see some, like I remember tennis players doing them, they're good for chewing on too to help avoid, chew them to avoid chewing on their, their clothing. Um, I've seen that quite often be successful. Great, excellent, thanks Terry. All right, so uh, let's see, I've got just a couple of uh, other questions here and it looks like we're getting short on time. Um, can any of us recommend or is it recommended to use chewing gum for a student uh, who has ADHD and might need help uh, concentrating on writing activities? Oh yeah, definitely. That's a great way to help concentration. Help with concentration. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Let's see, just looking through here. Um, got a comment here about bubble wrap being a good uh, a good thing to use as well. Um, uh, I'm seeing a number of questions on uh, timers. And again, the, the timers that we have, uh, or that Ravina has featured on the slides, um, we will send information out about everything uh, for those. But Ravina, do you wanna just touch on timers one more time? I'm, I'm seeing a number of people asking questions about uh, various uses of timers. You wanna just give us a right. quick statement right. there? So um, there's different types of timers and you can definitely use what's on your phone or an iPad or a computer, you can just type in timers in case you don't want to purchase a timer. And the reason you use timers, and this can be for any child, um, typically developing or children with disabilities, the purpose of timers is for students and children to understand that the activity that they're doing, especially if it's non-preferred, is not going to last a lifetime. And so I, for my younger kids, I really like using this timer um, because you can set it, it's automatic. And uh, so usually I'll say, okay, you have five minutes and let's say they're playing a game or they're playing with something preferred. They all see that the light will turn green. And then once um, there's two minutes or one minute left, it turns yellow. And then when the time's up, it's red and it starts beeping. And so um, that's when the child I've, I've noticed will then put away the preferred activity and start doing the non-preferred activity. And then I set the timer again so that they understand, okay, like you have five minutes to do this activity and then you can go do something else. This timer is really great um, just if you're a teacher or even if you're at home and you really want uh, your children or students to understand that um, uh, that there's going to be less that there will be less time, and so this red will start to go to zero, so that they visually see that time is getting less without understanding the concept of time. Um, this one, I believe, is a good one too. Uh, because it has, it's it's a little bit easier to do the settings for the timing, and then it'll just turn green and make a noise once the timer is up. Um, but once again, the use of timers is really great, especially for children who are showing behaviors. Uh, they're tantruming or they're throwing things on the floor because now they have to do an activity they don't want to do. But if you use a timer and say, "All right, you have five more minutes." or you have two more minutes, then they'll understand, okay, like she's telling me that I don't have all day with this train to play with. I need to then do a handwriting activity. And then once I do that, I can go back to my trains. And that's when first then boards are also really useful. And your occupational therapist or teacher can give you one if you need one for home. 
And if I can uh, just follow up on that too, again, for people who are at home and are looking for things they can use, the visual idea of a timer helps to show passage of time. Time is not always easy to understand, nor is the numeric ideas behind time. So if you have an egg timer, and I know I'm dating myself when I say an egg timer, but at least you know two or three of us out there will recognize this. But if you have an egg timer at home, you can use that as a timer too. And that often becomes a very good way for an individual to kind of grasp how long it is they should be doing something, even something like brushing teeth or washing hands. So, Ray, if you're meaning by an egg timer, if you're meaning like a sand timer, um, yeah, that's, sand timer. that's correct. Sand timers. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sand timers usually people have at home. Your phone has a timer. The internet, uh, if you just type timers, there's some fun timers for kids. Absolutely. Great, great points, everyone. Uh, great thoughts on timers. And uh, speaking of timers, it looks like we're out of time. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Terry. Uh, thanks, Terry and Ray, for your input here. And Rabina, thank you very much for uh, all of this great information that you provided us with today. Yeah. Um, thank just, you all for listening. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, just to, to recap for everyone, um, again, we will be sending out your certificate of attendance. We will be sending out uh, a copy of the recorded presentation uh, that will come this afternoon by email uh, to all of you, and also a copy of the, the slide presentation that Ravina was using here today. Um, after you exit the webinar today, if you're attending live, then you will see a survey window for each of you uh, who are with us here uh, today, if, if you wouldn't mind taking a brief moment to fill out the survey and help us understand what you liked uh, or what maybe you didn't like about the presentation uh, so that we can take that feedback and, and use it to make these presentations better and better. Um, again, thanks everyone for attending today. I will go ahead and uh, stop the broadcast now.